Right from the beginning, I just wrote in my own voice, and even and then what I discovered was that people some that what I the way I look at things or the way I think or the way I write things down, other people are, are the ones that find it comedic, or you know not. I, and I like to think I don't like to say you know comedic writer, I, I, I or comedy writer, but it's just you know give myself credit for saying like wry. This stuff is wry. Um, but I think there's a combination usually of wry, wryness and poignancy. And so it's more just can't really explain. It's just sort of the way I write. And when I write it, I remember with Ian at Lake Divine and I submitted it to my agent and I said, um, thought to myself, well, here's my really serious book. It was about a restricted hotel and anti-Semitism. And right away, it was, you know, the first thing I heard was, oh, it's so funny. I thought, well, you know, why fight that? The novel, I had uh, 65 pages, and it was third person, and it was not a widow narrating it. And then, you know, when Bob died, um, it wasn't that I thought, well, this is my new life. I don't write about myself anyway. But I thought, I know one sister will be divorced and out of money, and the other one will be widowed, and the third sister says, you two should live together. And I didn't even identify because I thought, well, I'm newly widowed and my character, I'll make her widowed two years. And of course, then I caught up to her and I had to push her out of the house. And then I had to push myself out of the house. Um, that's code for like, I like started dating. Yeah, like, you know, I, oh, I learned that, you know, even in the saddest, grimmest times, then it's not that sort of sustained grieving and misery. And I learned this when my husband's brother died um, in 1995. And I was in, it was in California and visiting. And the day after he died, my sister-in-law and I went to Trader Joe's. And so it was sort of life goes on. Uh, not that we were then food shopping. It was, you know, pre-funeral. But there, not every moment is solemn. And I'm also, I realized this when my husband was sick, extremely good at compartmentalizing. And so I could sort of put, th I can put things in their own little compartment and go to the computer or just, um, you know, talk to a friend or, and just find not so much the humor in the situation, but I, I have a very good friend soon after Bob died, and I sometimes have to apologize for being, you know, a cheerful person. And she said, I think your default setting is cheerful. With the essays, as you're reading along in the essays, then Bob is alive. It's sort of coupling columns, the coupling columns, he was all alive. And then there's a new section, and it's called Since Then. And so it's, it's about, you know, life, about his decline and death and the great things that my son was, I was in Massachusetts and my son was in California and he came home for a visit and said, I'm coming home. And I said, no, I'm managing. And he said, it's going to get worse. My husband had a fatal kind of dementia called frontotemporal dementia. Um, I can't live with myself being so far away and it's the right thing to do. So I wrote an essay both about Bob's decline and then, you know, Ben's being the wonderful son and the essays are dedicated to Ben. It says for Benjamin Austin, champion son. This one, it's called, oh, so the essay collection which came, was, is being brought out at the same time by Houghton Mifflin. Um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and it's uh, divided into four sections. One is Meet the Family, uh, the second is On Writing, and then Coupling Columns, which were um, seven or eight that I wrote for, or maybe ten, for the Boston Globe, I was a rotating columnist, and then after that there's a shorter chapter called Since Then, which is sort of update. Uh, so the one I'm reading <laughs> is from the family, Meet the Family, and where's my, oh, and it's called Sex Ed. <laughs> when my son was nine years old, 
A family friend gave him, why do our bodies stop growing? Questions about human anatomy answered by the Natural History Museum. <laughs> the illustrated book was a big hit, filled with the occasional half-goofy question like, is it true that you can eat an apple standing on your head, or is the skull one big bone? On page 88, Ben found question 132, the loaded one, which asked, when do I stop being a child? Beneath that were three paragraphs on puberty, including a sentence that got his attention. Quote, body changes in adolescence turns girls into young women who can have babies and boys into young men who can make women pregnant. That there was a connection between boys and babies had apparently never occurred to Ben. How, he asked, incredulous, do men make women pregnant? <laughs> I, the evolved parent at child's re child rearing sacred crossroads said, um, let's go ask daddy. <laughs> And then, to prove it was science rather than cowardice added, he's a doctor. <laughs> Daddy was watching TV. I repeated Ben's question. My husband said in a voice I didn't hear very often, therapeutic, pedagogical, Fred Rogers, well, sure, I can answer that. Do you want to sit down? And truly, Planned Parenthood could have videotaped his presentation <laughs> and distributed it. The penis, the vagina, the sperm, the egg, logically, calmly, no smirking. Ben listened and didn't interrupt. When Bob finished, Ben asked, not coyly but suspiciously, how does the seed get in there? Remote control? <laughs> Bob said no. The man puts his penis into the woman's vagina. After a few moments of contemplation, Ben asked, do you have to get naked to do this? <laughs> Bob said, Bob said, yes, you did. Did you and mom get naked? Bob said, I believe we did. <laughs> Our son stood up, exited the room, and yelled from the kitchen, I'm never doing that. <laughs> we waited for his return and his follow-up questions. I said, that was excellent. You couldn't have done any better. We'll see, said Bob. A few, days, a few days later at the kitchen table, Ben asked me as casually as he could, without looking up from his breakfast, how did girls get pregnant? I said, Ben, you remember, Daddy told you the whole story two nights ago. His tone changed to one of weary tolerance, as if I were the one who needed the refresher. Yeah, yeah, he said, I know. The man takes a seed out of his tush and the woman eats it. <laughs> Well, why not? <laughs> it had its own charm. And I was, I was learning something valuable. One shouldn't push the facts of life too early. I'd like to think I corrected his misapprehension on the spot, but I don't remember doing so. School took the next step, a unit named Human Growth and Development, formerly known as Human Growth and Change, amended after some parent, this was a lab school at Smith College after all, worried that the word change would traumatize. That's true. The boys and girls were separated for the classes. The boys got, I swear, Mr. Wiener, it's true, <laughs> an experienced and married sixth grade teacher. Fifth grade proved to be good timing developmentally because Ben would study his vocabulary list without snickering. Again, Bob did the quizzing. Vulva, I heard him ask evenly from the next room. To which Ben would answer equally clinically, the external genital organs of the female. Vas deferens. The main duck that carries semen, our 10-year-old answered, as matter-of-factly as if the topic were Cotton Gin and Eli Whitney. Section two of Human Growth and Development was co-ed a year later in the spring of sixth grade. I asked Ben how that was going, boys and go girls together. It was fine, he said, his tone implying, why wouldn't it be? I asked how his friend Nathaniel was coping with this mature subject matter, because I knew from Nathaniel's mother that he still believed in the tooth fairy and Santa Claus. Ben answered as if venting a class-wide scorn over Nathaniel's reproductive IQ. Nathaniel, he didn't even know what PMS was. <laughs> 
Seventh, seventh grade brought a new school in mid-year, a new unit called Simply Health. Ben announced it at breakfast, sighing and saying, we start health today, a pause and a wry smile. I was his best audience and he knew it. Third year in a row, I learn about fallopian tubes. <laughs> he was an old hand. The teacher later told me that when Ben presented his special project on conjoined twins featuring Chang and Eng, Barnum's famous act, he informed the class that both men had married. Long pause, shake of the head, then don't even ask about the honeymoon. <laughs> He's grown up now with his own place, a fruitful social life, and good sense. I'd like to thank Bob and Mr. Weiner, the playground, his bunkmates at camp, the locker room, the internet, and especially the talking transparent woman at Boston Museum, Boston's Museum of Science. It's an important job, and I couldn't have done it alone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I read that, I, uh, my first reading was uh, Tuesday night in New York, and my son was there. So I, no, no, I asked him first, and I said, how would you feel if I read that? And he said, oh, it's okay. And then I, oh, and by the way, you got the PG version, by the way. And um, he said, do me a favor, though. Don't introduce me before you read it. <laughs> because everyone's going to be checking on me to see my reaction to it. So I didn't, but um, he's in much, he's in a lot, and the book is dedicated to him, the essay collection.